Hello, welcome to the Star City Games Modern Open in Atlanta, part of the SCG Tour brought to you by Ultimate Guard and Carnox Chairs. I'm Nick Miller alongside Players' Championship competitor Oliver Tomiko. How are we doing? Uh, doing pretty well today. You're someone who qualified via playing a lot of dredge yes. in Modern. Faithless Looting got the axe, but that's not going to stop you from playing some of your favorites, like Narc Amoeba, Prized Amalgam, Creeping Chill. <laughs> that, one, that one's my favorite. I really love me some chill. But uh, we're doing a, something a little different now. Yes. We're playing, uh, we're playing Crab Vine, a mm. deck named after, obviously, Venge Vine and Hedron Crab. And we're this whole new graveyard yep. center deck. We're no longer Dredge. Conflagrate's not in the deck anymore. Yep. You know, the Dredge cards are gone. And we're up to something else. Yep. Talk about this deck and what, what your game plan is and what we're doing now. Yeah, so what this deck is trying to do is use the assortment of mill cards, the Citrus Supplier, Hedron Crab, as like your two main ones, uh, in combination with cards that are really good in the graveyard, like Vengevine, Prize Amalgam, and you just like try and turbo out some of these really fast cards. So when you have a Hedron Crab plus a Fetch Land, that's six cards milled, you throw in like a Stitcher Supplier, you're seeing like 10 cards on turn two, and sometimes you end up getting a bunch of these effects and it's just a ton of damage. And it's not like Dredge, where Dredge, sometimes you had really crazy starts, but you could also really grind people out with the conflagrates and just having like the loam plus blood glass package. Mm -hmm. This deck, we're not messing around. We're not trying to grind people out. It's like you want the game to be done by turn four, ideally. Other additions to the Hedron Crab, Stitcher Supplier, Limited All-Star, Merfolk Secret Keeper here. Just yeah. another effectively a Tome Scour with a body attached for whatever that's worth. And then here we go, Memory Sluice. Yeah, I we've didn't... got we've got conspire on a card. I haven't read that in years. I literally didn't know that existed until I saw this. Um, yeah, I didn't want to mention those two because those are a little more of the embarrassing <laughs> ones. But they they do serve like kind of a similar role because obviously you just need a high density of these self mill effects. The additional body on the Merfolk is actually somewhat important with Vengevine because you can mill yourself turn one and then turn two you play like a crab, play a land and then you can cast the body to try and trigger the Vengevine. So that comes up a decent amount, and it also means that you usually want to cast the Merfolk as your first spell on turn one because it's like not wasting a creature cast, which sometimes is relevant. Uh, another addition to this deck that we found over the week was the Gurmag Angler, which it looks a little bit like kind of just like slotted in as like a random card because we have so much self mill. Mm -hmm. And it is partly that, but it's also really nice when the deck kind of fails, which doesn't happen that much because you play so many cards that are good in the graveyard that you're usually going to hit a decent number of them, but sometimes you end up hitting uh, like a Narc Amoeba and a Creeping Chill, and that's not really that much power. So when you play a Gurmag Angler in addition to that, it does, you know, give you like basically a backup plan. Right. Outside of that, you have your Prized Amalgam, your Venge Vine, and your Grave Crawler here as your creatures. Yeah. How, what's the goldfish on this deck and like, how are you brawling with other decks that are putting creatures into play? Okay, yeah. So with, it, it does depend on basically the matchup. If you're playing against a deck like Tron or Amulet deck where they're really not interacting with you at all, you can mulligan pretty aggressively to find the crab because the crab mills so much faster, more efficient than everything else in the deck. And so when you have an opening with crab that doesn't die, you can kill turn three, turn four, like very consistently. Uh, versus decks that have a little bit more interaction, it it is like about turn four, turn five, but it's usually like you put so much on board that there's basically no way they can really interact with it, barring bad mills. Um, right, and there's not a ton of decks sweeping right yeah. now. There's not a lot of board wipes, so you get to do this go wide plan and then try to get there from there. Yeah, that's a big draw to this deck right now is that there isn't a ton of graveyard hate because there are so many decks in modern that are really like could be considered the top dog like you have Tron you have uh, all of the Urza decks which is both like PO and mid-range decks and there's also Shadow and so it really felt like this was a weekend where it was going to be really difficult for people to bring a bunch of graveyard hate because they needed to bring hate for all these other decks and so sure maybe they'll bring like 
a surgical or two, a cage. But like, it's not back when back in the it's dredge not days. Hogak days. Yeah, exactly. Where people are just coming with four ley lines. So this deck is pretty good at bypassing a lot of the interaction that people have at the moment. Right, and unlike Hogak that had to come prepared to fight all the hate, yeah. you don't really have that much interaction. Yeah. You have force negations and you have nature's claims is basically your only way to interact yeah. if people are bringing in yeah. hate. Yeah, it is a kind of minimalist because it really felt like if you need to be bringing a ton of answers to the graveyard hate, then like maybe you just shouldn't bring this deck because it is, it is quite linear. It is, it's really good at what it does, but beating a ley line, it's really difficult because you literally can't do anything without yeah, a Yeah, I'm trying to see what you could even cast here. Like, I guess you can just play Gravecrawler and, and Narc Amoeba yeah, and you, try to you do can, that. You can sometimes cast the Vengeman. I have two Overgrown Tombs in the deck, so sometimes you can actually beat down that way. But, I mean, obviously that's not very consistent right. that way. Last cards to mention here, Glimpse the Unthinkable. This is just like your supercharged yeah. mill. And then Once Upon a Time, uh, how's that working in the deck? Yeah, the Once Upon a Time in this deck, it's, at first when we had this deck, we had four Once Upon a Times, and it really seemed like this is like the perfect Once Upon a Time deck because it helps you hit the crab, it lets you kind of skimp on lands, and also just be more consistent with finding your one drops. The issue is that the casting the Once Upon a Time is basically impossible in this deck because you, two mana is a lot for this deck, and also it just doesn't really do that much. Like you're paying two mana to find like, a mill four. Right. So it's pretty poor there. So we tested like four once upon times, three once upon times, zero, one. We tested everything but two. And two, it could be right that two is the right number, but it's it's difficult because you drawing two once upon times is so bad in this type of deck that we ended up just basically turning once upon times into like more Gurmags, mm -hmm. the memory sluices. And we have one once upon a time over a land because you have to make sure that you have two lands in your hand at the beginning of the game because otherwise you won't be able to trigger your Venge Vines. And so Once Upon a Time is serving as like a functional land because you're so likely to handle land off the Once Upon a Time that when you're mulliganing, it's not like... Like if you see a Once Upon a Time, you can basically count as a land. Right. Yeah. You know you're in modern when two mana is a lot for your deck. Yeah. Uh, other sideboard cards here to wrap up. You've got your four Fatal Pushes, three Damping Spheres, and then two Stain the Mines. Uh, your removal, obviously, that's pretty clear. Damping Spheres against yep. the the ramp decks yep. and such, but what about the uh, the old Stain the Mines yeah, here? Yeah, Stain the Mine, it's like kind of just a concession to the fact that we don't have like great random matchups like Ad Nauseam and Storm and decks that are like spell-based combo that kill on like turn three. And so like you board and Stain the Mines, you can pretty consistently cast it on turn three. Mm -hmm. And so against decks like those decks, Amulet Titan, you just sometimes score free win. Even against like the Urza PO decks, if you name Urza, it's a lot harder for the deck to do anything. All right, last question. How many times have you conspired memory sluice? Um, today, I think once. Okay. I think once. <laughs> I have to know, is it a thing that happens frequently in it, your testing, or is it, it just... It happens a decent amount, because sometimes you have a start where you cast, like, a guy in uh, one of these one drops on turn one, you cast uh, another one on turn two, and it's like, you didn't really get much, and then you can cast the sluice. And then you also can sometimes cast the sluice on turn one, and hold the creatures if you only have two creatures and can't trigger a Venge Vine. It's basically just like an, another one that sometimes functions as like a mini uh, Glimpsey Unthinkable, but also costs one mana when you need to. Sure. All right, well, Faithless Looting might be gone, but your dreams of putting things into the graveyard and playing a wild deck have not gone oh, yeah. away. Oliver, thanks for joining me as usual. Thank you. Stay tuned to Star City Games all weekend long for the action here in Atlanta.